How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? This is Jeff Benjamin with 9 to 5 Mac in this episode of Back to the Mac. I want to talk about the Mac Pro specifically. I want to talk about why, number one, why I decided to upgrade from the iMac Pro to the Mac Pro, why I decided on the configuration I purchased, and most importantly, I want to discuss the upgrades that I've made to this machine thus far. So I added some flash storage. That's the most exciting thing. I didn't just add four terabytes. I didn't just add eight terabytes. I didn't even stop at 12 terabytes or 16 for that matter. Yeah, I kind of went crazy when it comes to flash storage. And I also upgraded memory as well, but I'm just most excited about this because it's just so much flash storage. 20 terabytes of storage, no, 24 terabytes of flash storage. So I have one gigantic 24 terabyte super fast SSD in this Mac Pro. Now obviously you can't just stick an M.2 form factor SSD inside the Mac Pro because there's no place to install those. You need to employ the use of a PCIe carrier board which accepts those M.2 blades and then that board connects to the X16 PCIe slot inside the Mac Pro. And that's what's in this box right here. So of course, we're gonna talk all about this, but first, a brief word from our sponsor. Repairing and upgrading your Apple products is easy with iFixit's all-in-one fix kits. iPhone fix kits have everything you need to replace a cracked screen or a dying battery. The kit includes a custom driver, steel bits, opening tools, and more. And Mac fix kits let you replace your MacBook Pro's battery, upgrade the RAM, or swap in an SSD. Both kits include all the parts and tools you need and are backed by an industry-leading warranty. Plus, each kit includes a free illustrated step-by-step -step repair guide to show you the way. Click the link in the description to get your all-in-one repair kit today. And special thanks to iFixit for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. Thanks for watching 9to5Mac. Be sure to thumbs up, click the subscribe button, and then enable notifications with the bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. So I know a lot of you guys are probably thinking to yourself, Jeff, you do realize that you, you make YouTube videos, right? Do you really need a Mac Pro? And I'll answer that question for you. The honest answer to that question is no, of course not. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Like I don't need a Mac Pro to upload YouTube videos. I've been doing it for, for many years now without a Mac Pro. But I will say this, I upgraded to the Mac Pro from an iMac Pro, which arguably was more powerful than I needed in and of itself. But I upgraded because I wanted the expandability and that's sort of what I harped on in our top features video. The expandability of the Mac Pro is beyond any Mac computer that Apple has shipped thus far. And that is what excited me about this machine. That's what made me want it the, the moment I saw it is because wow, this machine can, can pretty much do whatever. Like you can upgrade it any way you see fit. For instance, I can add a capture card and capture video directly to my Mac Pro um, internally, right? That's really, really cool. Or I can add my own GPU if I want to do that. Or I can add my own PCIe SSD. Or, you know, it's just really the sky's the limit. Pretty much whatever you can think of to use this computer to do, you can do it. Did that make sense? I don't <laughs> That sounded like a riddle right there. But the point is, I didn't buy this Mac Pro because I needed the brute force strength to somehow edit 4K YouTube videos, which I've been doing for years. I can even do on a 12 inch MacBook, which is way underpowered, right? I wanted the Mac Pro and the reason I got the Mac Pro is because of its expandability, which is just amazing in practice, right? I've, and I've done some upgrades. We're gonna talk about some of those exciting upgrades here in just a second. But that's it. I mean, I didn't buy it for the, the brute force power, even though going from an eight core CPU on the iMac Pro to a 16 core CPU on the Mac Pro is really, really nice. Like, it's really nice, but it's all about that expandability. What do you guys think? Let me know down below in the comment section whether or not you agree uh, about the whole expandability rant. Uh, but to, for me, that is what makes the Mac Pro so incredibly appealing. So let's talk about the configuration that I opted for. For me, I really didn't make that many upgrades. I made two key upgrades. Number one, I went from the eight core base CPU to the 16 core CPU. Um, I did that primarily because, well, obviously it's nicer to have more cores for things like Final Cut Pro, but 
I was thinking about just going ahead and getting the eight core CPU and then upgrading myself to save a little money, but you're not gonna save any money by doing that. In fact, if you wanna go out and buy the, the 16 core CPU, it's gonna cost probably more than what Apple charges when it's all said and done. You factor in shipping and handling and all that, and then the work you have to put in to actually go in and upgrade the CPU yourself. It's just, to me, it's not worth it, at least right now. Now, in the future, like if you buy the eight core right now and you wait two, three years, those 16 core CPUs are gonna drop in price. They're gonna become more available and then upgrading would make sense, right? But right now, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I got the 16 core CPU, not to mention the fact that the RAM actually runs at a slower speed on the eight core base model when compared to the 12 through 28 core model. So something else to keep in mind there. The only other upgrade that I made was going from the 256 gigabyte SSD to a one terabyte SSD. And I did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's just really meager amount of storage, right? Uh, especially your boot drive, you have all your applications on there, you have Catalina installed. You're not gonna have that much space left over once it's all said and done, especially if you're running really big apps like Final Cut Pro, Logic Pro, things that take up a lot of space. It just doesn't make sense to try to micromanage 256 gigabytes of storage. Go ahead and get the one terabyte version. Uh, another thing to consider is that if you want to have a bootcamp partition that runs obviously on the, the internal SSD, that's gonna take up even more space. So then you're, you're even more, you're micromanaging. And I just don't wanna to have to worry about that on a machine of this caliber. It just doesn't make sense to me. So I highly recommend not necessarily going up beyond one terabyte, but I highly recommend going from 256 to one terabyte for sure. So besides those two upgrades, everything else is the base configuration. Even the GPU, I kept it at that Radeon Pro 580X, which is, is definitely a bottleneck for me. I do wanna upgrade the GPU desperately, but I'm waiting on that Radeon W5700X, which for my needs is a little bit more appealing as far as uh, encoding and things of that nature. I'll discuss that in another video, but I'm waiting on Apple to actually ship that in a standalone unit. Um, it's not even shipping during in the build to order configuration right now. Uh, so that's what I'm waiting on, the uh, Radeon W5700X. All right, so let's talk about the real exciting thing right now, and that is upgrades, because like I said, it's all about expandability, right? I'm gonna talk about two key upgrades that I made on the Mac Pro thus far in this episode of Back to the Mac. All right, so let's talk about these upgrades, shall we? We're gonna start with the SSD. So I have a 24 terabyte PCIe SSD courtesy of these drives from Sabrent. These are Sabrent Rocket NVMe SSDs, four terabytes per unit. So I have six of these units for 24 terabytes total in a RAID 0 configuration. So thanks to Sabrent for helping me out here. They sent over four of these. I purchased two of them myself. And frankly, I'm just intrigued about the idea of having a 24 terabyte SSD inside my Mac Pro. It just sounds like a dream, not only from a capacity perspective, but also from a speed perspective as well. Not to mention that it doesn't make any noise with an asterisk. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but here we go. We have six of these guys and we're going to install them with a major assist from the Amphotech Squid PCIe carrier board. And that's what allows us to connect six M.2 SSDs to a single PCIe slot inside the Mac Pro. So inside the box, you get a lot of accessories. You get a power connection. Basically, it just piggybacks off a separate PCIe slot to give you additional power. There's also an ETX power. There's a terminal cable for USB to do some advanced functions. And there's also this little guy right here, a screwdriver with two different bit options. So that's nice. And you're also given a reminder about installing the heat sinks on the M.2 blades because they get extremely hot, especially when you're really pushing the drive. It gets very, very hot. So something to keep in mind. So here it is, folks. This is the squid carrier board and it can accommodate not just one, two, three, or four SSDs, but it can accommodate six SSDs at the same time. Three on the front, three on the back. And that's what really makes this little guy special because it can house so many SSDs simultaneously. 
So the setup process is pretty self-explanatory. There's a lot of other functions that this board has, a lot of other bells and whistles that we can talk about if I do a full review. If you wanna see a full review of this guy, please let me know down below in the comments and I will try to do that for you. But in this video, it's just basically an overview. I just wanna show you what this thing can do as far as allowing you to connect so much flash storage to your Mac Pro. And I'll configure these drives in a RAID 0 configuration, so I'll have just one giant 24 terabyte SSD. So to prepare for installation, I'm just gonna remove the three screws on one side, insert the M.2 SSD, and then reapply the screw. Just make sure it's firmly in the slot, and then screw it in like this. Super simple, super easy. All right, and you can do all that by hand. You don't need any special tools for that. Um, and I'm doing that for all three of the drives on one side, and then I just simply flip it over, and then I just install the remaining three SSDs using the same exact process. So there's one, two, and three. So there we go, folks. Not just three, but six SSDs because there's three on the opposite side. Now you also have the heat spreaders and you just want to install those. And then you just wanna make sure you install the heat spreader as close to the connection on the board as possible. All right, so that's gonna help get rid of some of that heat that these things generate, which is a lot. And there's also a couple of fans if you didn't notice. I mean, they're pretty prominent there. But the problem with the fans is that they are insanely loud. I mean, like ridiculously loud. And I just had to remove them because I couldn't deal with the sound. Uh, in a data center, no problem. But if you're trying to work at home or in the studio, no. This is how it sounds. I'm sorry about the potato camera there. I just had my iPhone. Listen to that. That's way too loud. So. Needless to say, I disconnected the fans and then I talked to Ampletech and they said, just remove the fans, that will help with airflow. So that's what I did. And it did help a lot with airflow. The drives remained a little bit cooler. They still get really hot, but they are cooler than they were when I just had the fans off and still connected. So I configured all six of these drives in a RAID 0 configuration using Soft RAID. And then you see my full storage set up here via daisy disk you have my main drive one terabyte then i have a boot camp partition there is the 24.6 terabyte ssd which is just insane i mean having that much flash storage on demand is incredible um i will say obviously raid zero presents its own issues however i fully realize that i have a backup plan i have you know, nightly backups, and I do have backups of all my media. Obviously, you don't want to just have one copy on a RAID 0 drive of something that you can't afford to lose. I've never had a, a drive fail in a RAID 0, at least an SSD fail in a RAID 0 setup. I've never had it happen, and I've been running similar setups for years, but it's always a possibility, right? So you can see the speed there, very, very fast, but not as fast as the Samsung Evo Pro. Uh, with those drives, you get six of those guys, you're talking over 10 gigabit per second easily. But here, definitely nothing to sneeze at. You're getting ridiculous speed. It's gonna handle 6K, 8K media with no issue whatsoever. Uh, this thing is extremely fast and not just extremely fast, it's also very, very dense because you have so much storage available. It's almost like having the promised Pegasus R4i that we reviewed not too long ago, but in a flash storage sort of configuration. And of course you could run RAID 5 on here if you wanted to, or RAID 10 if you wanted to, if you're really kind of squeamish about using RAID 0. But personally, like I said, I've never had a problem with RAID 0 for SSDs. They tend to be very reliable, uh, at least modern SSDs are concerned. I was able to transfer this 500 gigabyte, almost 500 gigabyte file in about two minutes and a few seconds, 27 seconds, I believe. Uh, and even at the end of the transfer, there wasn't any sort of like uh, throttling or anything like that occurring. It was fast from beginning to end. Yeah, two minutes, 27 seconds. So very impressed here. Now let's get to my second part of the upgrade. And that is, of course, adding RAM. And Nemix RAM is great. I highly recommend it. It is so much cheaper than Apple's, you know, build to order option for their RAM. 
Nemix sent me over these six RAM sticks, 64 gigabytes a piece. These are LR dims, so they will not mix with the R dims that Apple puts in its like base model Mac Pro, or if you didn't upgrade the RAM at all, you're gonna have R dims. Just something to keep in mind, the LR dims or the low to reduce dims are not gonna mix and match with the registered dims that come with lower configurations of memory in the Mac Pro. You can check Apple's website for details, but I believe if you get any dims with 32 gigabytes or less, they're gonna be registered dims or R dims and 64 gigabytes and more, they are gonna be LR dims. So just keep that in mind. So you can see all those pretty chips on that module. So we're gonna go ahead and install the last one. And you wanna make sure you install these modules properly so you can take advantage of the memory channels. We have a full write up on 9to5Mac explaining how to install these properly. And there's also a little guide inside the dim slot cover as well. All right, so here is our About This Mac. You can see 384 gigabytes, 2933 megahertz DDR4. You can see the installation. Everything looks good. You have six additional memory slots. So if you wanna add another 384 gigabytes for a total of 768 gigabytes, you could. But realistically speaking, this is overkill. I mean, obviously, right? It is nice though to have a lot of RAM because not only can you run tons of applications, they have all have access to plenty of RAM. They're not restrained for resources. You see all these apps running here. You see multiple virtual machines running. And with all that going on, all the apps I have open, all the virtual machines, Final Cut Pro, Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and still have plenty of RAM. And most importantly, there is nothing swapping out to disk, which definitely will slow you down. I used to encounter that quite often on my iMac Pro. So that concludes this episode of Back to the Mac. First and foremost, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks for the subscribes. Really, really, really appreciate you watching this episode. And um, what do you guys think about the Mac Pro? And what do you think about these upgrades? I know some people are gonna say, it's a waste of money, Jeff, why'd you do it? And uh, some other people are gonna say, this is pretty awesome. I'm firmly in the pretty awesome camp, but I understand why you would think it's a waste, especially if you're not gonna really take advantage of all of those resources. So let me know what you guys think down below. And also because this is Back to the Mac, it wouldn't be right to conclude the episode without a giveaway. So we're giving away this CalDigit Tough Nano SSD. It's a portable SSD, 512 gigabytes. Um, it is IP67 rated, so it's gonna be able to resist water and dust. Uh, it has USB 3.2 Gen 2, USB-C connectivity. So that's gonna give you 10 gigabits per second connectivity. You're gonna get up to 1,050 megabytes per second read. So it's plenty speedy enough to get 4K workflows and the like done. So if you want this, all you have to do is leave a comment down below and subscribe to 9to5Mac on YouTube. You're automatically entered and actually anyone can enter no matter where you are, as long as it's legal for me to ship this thing to you, you can enter because this thing's small enough to where I, I actually don't have to take out a mortgage to pay for shipping, which is also really, really cool. So uh, if you wanna enter, be sure to do so. And again, thank you so much for watching Back to the Mac and special thanks to our sponsor, iFixit. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac. Special thanks to iFixit, creator of the iPhone Fix Kits and MacBook Pro Fix Kits for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. Head over to iFixit using the link in the description and get your all-in-one repair kit today.